Very good. All right, so let's get started. Um, today's lecture topic is data science for uh, it is continuation of our discussion on data science for business. And today we're going to talk about introduction to machine learning. So this is going to be somewhat a tutorial on uh, machine learning at large. Now, uh, for those of you who are familiar with machine learning and data science who has taken the courses, this can be an easy reminder of what it is for those who, who never tried data science or machine learning. Recording in progress. This is going to be um, first introduction to the topic. So what is machine learning? And so where is machine learning within um, overall computer science? Um, it, it is a subfield that uh, studies development of all, that develops and studies algorithms, um, the algorithm that can learn from data uh, without being given, without being explicitly programmed. Now, typically algorithms can detect patterns in data and use examples uh, to learn from them. Now, deep learning is a subset of machine learning algorithms that are based on neural networks. And within this deep learning now, there is even smaller subset of so-called large language models or foundation models. Um, and sort of the chat GPT is, is based on those. Now, overall machine learning is a part of AI, which is a part of much bigger discipline um, that is a computer science. So we're gonna be focusing on sort of classical machine learning. Deep learning typically takes, uh, needs a lot of data. Deep learning algorithm needs a lot of data to be trained and uh, you know, a little harder to train than classical machine learning algorithms. So in this course, we will be mostly focusing on you know, classical machine learning. So to talk a little bit more, uh, how is machine learning different from sort of traditional software or sometimes people talk about automation uh, systems. Well, the main difference is in the following. So traditional software or automation systems, they actually take in rules and data and then using those rules to act on data and, and, and uh, receive some actions or, or get some answers. Now, machine learning, is really about creating those rules first and then applying it to the data. So you can think about machine learning as finding a way based on the examples or based on the structure in the data to create those rules that can later can be used for um, automation purposes. So whenever we use and apply machine learning, there is really sort of two phases um, in that. So the first one, is we actually need to design a model, we need to train the model, um, and then we need to test, make sure it actually does the things that we expect it to do. Now, then when you have a model, you actually deploy this model in the production, and then you give new data and model can generate predictions for you. Um, this is also usually called inference. So you have training and testing of the model, which is sort of what usually data scientists do. And then you have model inference when the model is being used um, in, in, in real life applications. That's where typically it's, it's done by end users. So, um, you know, here, here is a very simple example. Um, when we want to train a model, um, we are providing, we usually give models some data, right? And in this case, the data is, um, you know, in the form of a table. Often we talk about this as a historical data, right? So, so data that has been previously collected. And the algorithm looks at the data, searches for patterns in the data and creates a model. In this case, the model is a tree. And the tree has been created such a way that it satisfies um, the historical data in the sense that, for example, this model uh, is trained on a, uh, on, or to, to predict whether you know, something is gonna be accepted or rejected, right, the class. And it means the historical data, the model 
uh, satisfies the historical data or it's built, the this, this, this tree is built based on the data. And then when you get it into the production, right, or in the inference phase, uh, you provide a new data item that the model hasn't seen before. Um, and then based on the model, it makes a decision. And in, in this case, for example, you know, the, the accepted, rejected, it uh, says that yes, the class can be accepted, but um, there is a probability uh, for, that for, for that action. So whenever we think or talk about um, you know, machine learning models, there is really sort of this triad of things, right? It is, you know, the algorithms, which is um, the, you know, the, the, the code that we're gonna, that we run, and that is the thing that is learning, right? The data on which uh, algorithm learning and the training process. So you actually need to train algorithm to do anything useful. And algorithm learns from data. Learning is uh, really the process of finding out the internal structure of the data and estimating unknown dependencies in data from um, the given observations, right? The, the word we usually use uh, for the models is generalization. And generalization means you learn the patterns from the small subset of data that you have at hand, and you can actually generalize it to perform on all the data that's out there that you haven't seen yet. So as we mentioned before in the previous lecture, you know, there are three main types of machine learning. Um, and we'll be focusing on you know, supervised and unsupervised learning. Now, in supervised learning, the goal is to find the mapping in between input and output. Um, so find the function that maps x's into y's, where x is input data or sometimes called independent variables, and y is your response, sometimes called dependent variables. In unsupervised learning, uh, we are going after the different goal when we're trying to learn the patterns and the structure in the data. Today, we'll talk more about supervised learning as you know, within business, we're mostly using um, you know, supervised learning. Now, speaking of the methods out there, there are you know, lots and lots and lots and lots of various methods, um, but if we try to sort of classify them, organize them, then sort of machine learning, we divide into supervised methods, as I uh, explained in the previous size, unsupervised and, and reinforcement learning, we're not looking at it right now. So it's supervised and unsupervised. Now within supervised methods, um, there are two classes. One is classification and the second is regression. Well, classification is when we uh, try to predict class or type of an object, for example, distinguishing of cats versus dogs. And regression is when we're trying to um, predict a number, right? Let's say we're predicting sales volumes. Um, unsupervised learning, um, typically it, we, when we talk about unsupervised learning, we have in mind clustering or trying to find um, groups of points that are, uh, or groups of objects that are more similar among themselves than, than, than the rest, right? And sort of grouping or finding the groupings in the data. But also uh, we talk about dimensionality reductions or ways to represent data with sort of sometime, I mean, often with a loss, uh, but with a smaller representations. Now, classification, well, there are very many algorithms exist, classical algorithms, um, some of them, quite old, goes back, dates back to like 60s or 70s. Some are more, so some are newer, but typically we're talking about like decision tree algorithm, which is really about building a tree that helps us to make a decision. Uh, nearest neighbors algorithms, uh, various Bayesian algorithm. Um, there are ensemble methods, um, you know, there are support vector machines and many more. Um, there are of course neural networks and the deep learning is, very large neural networks. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning, um, we're not going to talk about them a lot because you know they require uh, quite a lot of data to train and uh, um, the computational resources to do it and, and, and sort of skills to do this. 
Now, when we're talking about regression, this is again predicting numbers. Um, there are again uh, sort of linear regression, ensemble methods, decision trees, um, support vector regression. So pretty much very similar methods as for classification. Uh, within clusterings, there are also methods um, that we're going to be talking about, like k-means, like uh, you know hierarchical clustering. And uh, for dimensionality reduction, classical methods are principal component analysis, um, supported uh, or or single value decomposition, or more modern methods for various so-called manifold learning. But what's interesting is if you actually look into what sort of what methods are used in practice, um, and and in a real world setting, right? Um, there are a lot of regressions. There are a lot of decision trees. You know, clustering, um, then a bit of random forest, and then sort of the rest of the techniques. So, you know, covering the first, say, three methods, three four methods, you will cover. You will probably kind of cover everything that that is needed uh, today. That's people using today. So, supervised learning regression, and again, I just want to remind that now we're going like very very fast. This is you know, overview of what methods are. And we're gonna be talking more in depth um, about this, these methods uh, when we start doing uh, use cases, right? We'll be actually learning how to use these methods on a particular use cases. So right now, um, the goal is to, you know, have a big picture of, uh, of, 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 of the world, right? So, when you're thinking about supervised learning, um, and we're talking about regression, uh, we're thinking about the way to predict um, the value of, as I said, y uh, based on, on a given parameter x. And uh, the regression can be univariate, where you just have um, one unknown variable, like here TV sales, uh, like here TV is TV advertising, actually, I think. And, and then there was sort of sales or multivariate, where you have multidimensional data, um, where you know you you have different, um, you, you're trying to learn very different functions. So if on the left hand side, um, I'm trying to, for example, learn function y is f of x, then here it's going to be I'm trying to learn function f of x1, x2, where x1 and x2, those two um, x's. If I'm talking about classification, these are, you know, these are different settings. Here, um, I, the response variable is uh, categorical, so we're trying to predict a category of an object, and uh, you know we can try to do this um, either. Uh, we can either have like binary categorization, where we try to predict like on the left picture um, to which of those two groups, yes or no, uh, our objects belong to. Or it can be multi-class classification, like for example, uh, on the right-hand side, when you have images and we actually want to predict um, the class, in this case is like what digit is on the image, right? If um, the handwritten um, digit belongs to um, one of those uh, 10 classes. So the same way as, as, as with uh, regression, you know, when we think about classification, we can think about doing it based on one type of variable, for example, or many type of variables, or we call them also features. And based on that, we can build, um, for example, decision trees, and we're gonna look into this a little bit later, but the idea is that um, the, the features can be like here is, I believe it is, uh, you know, age and for example, balance um, on, on the credit card. And depending on the balance and age, we can uh, decide the probability of uh, clients default. Or as on, the, on this picture, on the left hand side, um, the features are the shape and the color of the object. So based on those features, we'll try to group that. Now, 
you know, the reason that, you know, both regression and classification in some sense are quite similar problems, and you, you see it's sort of the, the same type of algorithm, just designed slightly differently, is because they are, right? Um, on the left-hand side, we're showing here a regression where you have a few data points, we have data points, and um, I would like to predict a numeric value um, for unknown variable x. And uh, um, to do that, for example, using uh, linear regression, um, I would like to you know, draw some line through those points such that when I pick up x, I'll get some value of y. Um, and x is continuous, so y values are continuous in this case. But we can also think about classification. And within the classification, we not only can assign card assigned classes um, of, of the events or, or classes of the objects, but we can actually predict probability of a particular event. Um, and then um, the, the result will be not only um, the category or binary, like for example here, binary category, but um, it's gonna be a probability that the object belongs to that um, category. And here example is we have for certain values of X, we have objects belonging to one category and this category, sort of one category uh, um, that corresponds that's here represented as the value zero. Um, and here is another category, which is, this is number two, number two class or number two category. And um, it corresponds to the value of one. And, you know, we can actually do either very simple regression, but that doesn't make a lot of sense. So we can actually then try to match this uh, distribution of points with some curve, which is in this case is, um, uh, is, is shown here in, in red. And um, this is actually a curve called logistic regression. So again, these are just quick examples. So you would kind of get familiar uh, with the terminology and you know where it is used and how it is used. Now, an important topic within the machine learning is really the quality of the model. And um, the art form is to select the right, com the correct complexity of the model for a given task. Now, when we talk about this, we usually describe it as a model fit or overfitting. Um, looking at this picture, you can understand what this means. When you have some data points, you can actually try to fit different model models and models of different complexity. Like on the left side, we see a model, very simple model. It's a linear model, right? And it's, it's a simple model because it's really, you just need two parameters in this case, right? To describe the model. It's a straight line, AX plus B. But you can see that this model does not describe our data points well, right? It doesn't sort of fit them. Um, on the second picture, we see the model, which is actually too complex, right? So it kind of fits the data perfectly, right? But you need to remember that very often the data is collected from you know, experiments. And so the data might contain noise. And so in some sense, fitting the model perfectly or making your model go precisely through the data points um, is actually the wrong thing to do because each of those data points have some uncertainties. So the, the, the real positions can be you know, either higher or lower. We don't know. And that is sort of the, the uh, error that comes from the experiment. So it wouldn't make sense to make your model go precisely through that uh, data. And the model is you know, getting very complex also because it will take a lot of parameters to describe it. So that's what we call overfitting. Now, on the right-hand side, we see the optimal model in terms of the complexity 
with respect to given, you know, to given data. So it is not a straight line, it is a quadratic model. So you'll need more parameters uh, to describe it, but it fits our data distribution much better than uh, the model on the left-hand side. So, you know, there were some rules of thumbs and um, there, there, it's, it's in, in some way like almost an art form to pick up um, the right model, but there are also ways to numerically verify that your model is correct, that it is not too simple, too complex, that you do not overfit. Uh, again, from this slide, the important is the terminology of overfitting and understanding that uh, you sort of tried too hard to um, map your model to the data. Here is another example of the model overfitting. If we talk when we talk about classification, um, if you notice, um, there are two classes: red dots and blue dots. And uh, you know, at some points, the blue dots kind of getting deeper into the the red area, and red dots um, getting deeper into the blue area. And so, yes, you can try to draw a separate. And, and the, the goal is for the classification is to draw the separating line, right? That separates those two classes. And you know, you can make it. You can draw it with this the way it is shown in in green color. Um, where it perfectly separates those two uh, classes. But when you do that, you should keep in, in, in mind that the precise posi that the positions of the data points might not be very precise. And so uh, what you learned is not a real boundary, but what you learned is the boundary affected by noise. And so to compensate for that, what you want to do is you want to add some smoothness to the model and so, yes, you will still have a uh, not a straight line, right? Because if you draw a straight line here, um, like for example, I'll try, I'll, I'll you know, draw a line. Um, let's say right here. If that would be my separating line, like boundary, I will have a lot of uh, misclassified points. But if I'll draw a line that is smooth enough, and separates majority of the points into the appropriate classes, that is probably the right solution. And um, that, that sort of what we're looking for. So yet another important part of modeling is um, on top of the model accuracy is the notion of model explainability, which means that we actually can explain, looking at the model, how it, it made a particular decision. Now, some models inherently are so-called black box models, which is uh, the models that you don't really understand how they work internally. And you cannot, I mean, you understand the principles, but you don't understand why, how they make a particular decision. Um, at the same time, there are models that sometimes called white box models, those that are easy to interpret. So linear regression are easy to interpret. Um, there are a few coefficients and you can think of like, you know, if it is a straight line, you know, the coefficients will be this, the, the, the slope of the line and, and the shift of the line. And you can actually understand why it makes particular decisions and why it makes particular predictions. The same uh, true if you are thinking about a tree model, because you know, when you have an object and you have a properties and you have a decision tree, you can follow through um, the, the branches of the tree to reach the answer. And so you know why the model provided your answer it provided, right? Um, but there are some models where it is much, much, much harder. And like with deep learning models, it is usually very hard to understand why it uh, gave particular answer because the models are actually quite large. But at the same time, there is always a trade-off. You know, the, the more complicated and complex models, they, you know, they, they might understand your data, data better. And so um, they can predict data, they can predict um, better 
and they can provide you better quality. And uh, you know, simple models, they're easy to understand, but the quality, they might sort of give you the answers with a lower quality. And so whenever you look into the models, you, you always think about this trade-off, whether you need something that is explainable or you need something that just would work well and you really don't care why the model made a particular decision at a particular moment. And there are also some, sometimes there are some uh, pretty formal regulations on the type of the models you can use, for example, in healthcare or in financial industries. But, you know, towards sort of understandable white box models, you can think about like linear logistic regression decision trees. Um, so these are like really easy to explain. Uh, then there are models like random forest where you have multiple trees, where neural networks, deep learning, those are not easy to understand why they make the decisions. So they use it when we use them, they're usually black box models. Now, having said that, there has been a lot of work recently on uh, special tools and instruments that allow you to explore um, the models and, and try to better understand the decision they make, even if you, even for black box models, um, kind of querying them, getting the answer. And by this process, um, understanding better um, how they operate internally without sort of looking into, you know, in, inside. Um, but again, there is this always balance in between model explainability and uh, the model quality of prediction accuracy. So you need to choose where you want to be for your particular task. Now, here is a simple example of regression. Now, let's say we want to do regression. Um, these are you know, our data points. And uh, as we uh, talked so far, you know, we can try to do different models. Um, you know, probably making a model going through each and every data point, you know, that, that's clearly ridiculous, right? So we don't want to do that. Um, we can try to make a model that you know, maybe captures um, this trend, or we can actually go for maybe some very simple model that is a straight line and then the question would be if this line is that way or maybe something somehow like that. Now, when we draw this line, the question would be, you know, how precise the model is. And to answer that question, we need to measure uh, the difference in between the, the, the model, the predictions that the model will make versus um, the, you know, the, the actual values that we see. Um, and the way to do it in the case of regression, and that's sort of this, the line, that we just did is through so-called quality metrics. And in this case, uh, you know, in the case of progression, uh, we usually measure um, the distance in between the model and the actual um, data points. And uh, there, are, there could be like mean absolute error uh, defined as the sum of deviations or mean squared error or root mean squared error. Um, there is a metric which is called R squared. We're going to talk about it a little bit more um, later uh, when we're looking deeper into the examples. But the point is, again, is if we're looking at the, the model and we're looking at um, the data points, you know, we, we're trying to understand how well the model describes um, that data. And this is done by measuring the distance from all data points that we have um, to the model. Now, we're going to talk in a minute about training and testing the model, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, your, your model actually have the predictive power that, you know, you claim it has. Um, but the, the computational approach computing is that's what we need to do. We need to calculate those type of um, error metrics. If we have a classification problem, um, it's sort of similar story where we want to um, uh, decide how many points that we have has been correctly classified and how many has been incorrectly classified. Let's say I want to split this picture into three classes. Um, you know, I can do it probably, you know, this way and then, then I'm stuck, like whatever line I draw, um, even if I want to separate it here, there'll be a bunch of um, you know, green points 
um, that in, 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 let's say I call this blue, right? I call this green and I call this yellow. Then I got, I got a bunch of um, green points that on, on, on this side. So it's probably not a good um, way to, to separate um, the third class. Maybe I should do something like that. Um, then I'll get more of sort of cleaner um, green, uh, blue, yellow, and green. But then I have a lot of yellow points scattered there. So in some sense, looking at this picture, it's going to be very hard um, to come up with the way to separate the data to classify into three classes. Um, but if I look at some other example, some other example like this one, um, in this case, it can be actually very easy to um, find classes, right? I can have, for example, this separation line, I'll have this as a blue class, and uh, I can, for example, split it here, and this is gonna be um, yellow and, and green classes, and that gives me pretty good um, separation. And then I can actually measure the quality of my separation by calculating how many yellow points, for example, got into this green side and how many green points got into the yellow side. Now, um, as, as an example, we'll look into uh, the this, this scenario where you have uh, two classes, right? For example, as if, we, if we look at this picture and let's say I want to split into two groups, um, one group, as, as I said, they're gonna be, for example, you know, group of green, and that's a group will be say blue plus yellow. Um, then I can count count how many um, points I called green points, but they're in fact yellow points, and how many points I called yellow points, but they're in fact green points. And that will tell me about how my how many mistakes algorithm made. And of course, the fewer mistakes it makes, um, the better it is. Okay. So numerically, this can be expressed through class evaluation metrics, quality metrics. Um, it's usually, it's called the confusion matrix, what we have here, which measures, which compares uh, your predicted uh, classes versus actual, right? So we predict it to be green, what's actual value? And uh, say, let's say we predicted it's gonna be raining, is it raining or not? Uh, or we predict it's not gonna be raining, so it is not raining. But it's possible that we predicted that it is raining, but it is not, or it's possible that we um, predicted it's not gonna be raining, but it does rain. Now, why there are four classes? Well, because if you think about even examples with rain, the, the, the mistakes you make can, co can cost differently. Um, with example, with a rain, if you predict that uh, there will be a rain and you take umbrella with you, but there is no rain. Okay, well, the cost is you carry umbrella with you. But if you predicted there will be no rain, but there is rain and you didn't take your umbrella. Well, the cost is you get wet. So um, that tells you that there is really this sort of four different um, uh, you know, scenarios, right? Um, and that's why we talk about uh, you know, true positives that that predict event and event happens. True negative, which is predict event. Oh, I'm sorry, predict that something doesn't happen and it doesn't happen. And both of those true positive and true negatives are are the cases where the model performs correctly. And then the two cases when the model is wrong, when you predict an event and event doesn't happen, so it's false alarm or you fail to predict an event when the event happened, it's, it's a missed alarm. And, and so there are four numbers um, corresponding to this. And um, you know, we call them true positive, false positive, false negative, true negative. And then uh, we can think of sort of one single metric that um, can be used uh, to measure the quality of the classification. Now, um, as always, sort of devil is in details. Um, this metric works, but not always. And we're going to be talking about the cases when it doesn't work. It doesn't work in the scenarios where sort of the classes are imbalanced, which means you know there are many more um, examples of one class compared to another. 
Uh, but nevertheless, in many other cases, the metric works. And so it's good to know about it. Um, one more important, very important point. So when we do modeling, we usually want to split the data into two separate sets. One is called training set, and the other one is called test set. So when you train the model, and training the model means finding the parameters of the model. Let's say um, if I have the simple y equal ax plus b model, you know, training will tell me uh, I will allow me to determine those two parameters. And we'll discuss you know, how later on how you can find those parameters. Testing means you actually have this model and you want to understand how well the model performs. What you do not want to do is you don't want to train and test on uh, the same data points. So if I go back. Um, let me clean this. If I go back to examples we had, um, say on, on a regression uh, part, um, I would want to mark some points, and this is all my data that I have. I will more want to mark some points, you know, select some subset of points. like this, that I store and not, do not touch. And I use the, less, the other points to actually find out you know, the, the best position for my line. Then I will take other points that I haven't used to calculate those coefficients for the, for the line and use them to measure the accuracy. So we, we divide the data into train and test. Now, it is very important. Um, we're going to talk about it more um, on the next lecture uh, when we look into the sort of practicals of doing it. But for right now, um, the, the key message is the quality of the model, the final quality of the model is measured on the test set. Right, and the test set is some data that your model has never seen before. Uh oh. Um, the way to split the data, you know, there are different sort of rules of thumbs. It can be like 80 20, right, where you take 80% of the data and use it to train the model, and 20% of the data you use to actually test the quality of the model. Now, you might say like, okay, wait a minute, but then it means that in some sense, I'm not using this part of the data to you know, train the model, right? I'm not using it to, to, to learn anything, right? And also, you know, I selected the particular way, I selected the test set particular way, well, you know, maybe I just by mistake or somehow I was unlucky. So I selected some data points that are not very representative. And so, you know, the, my, my metrics, my measurements would be very biased. And th that is sort of definitely valid concern. And so that's why typically when we do a tra train test split, we use uh, the approach that is called cross validation, where instead of just splitting the data once, we actually run multiple trading and multiple test um, uh, sessions when the test has been selected, test data has been uh, selected each time differently, right? Different parts of data. And so, you know, if we do it like five times, it's called five-fold cross-validation. If we do it 10 times, it's gonna call, can, it will be called um, 10 times cross-validation. And then when we calculate error on the test set, uh, we then 
um, averaging this error. And this is, of course, much more stable, much more representative um, for your model performance than just um, you know, using a simple train test, um, training and testing split. Now, but it actually gets even deeper. Uh, the reason is um, quite often when you try to build models, there are certain type of hyperparameters that you want to, that, that you need to find. So it's not only the model itself, but it's also some hyperparameters in the model. For example, it could be the depth of the tree you want to build. Or, you know, you, you might want to check different types of models, like you want to have a model that is linear, quadratic, cubic, et cetera, et cetera. So again, you do want to always sort of final, to, to test your final solution on the data set that hasn't been touched before, that model hasn't seen before. And if you need to do this model selection or hyperparameter selection, what you do is you do split your test, you split your data into three parts, into like training, validation, and testing. And so validation is really the part of the data that is used to tune up model hyperparameters. So you train your model um, on, on a training set, you use validation data to verify the model parameters, right? Um, then you can change the model parameters, again, use the validation data to see if the model performed better or worse, again, change parameters. And that's sort of the data that you're using to validate um, your you know, the optimality of your parameter setting. And then when, it, when you're all done, you do the final check, final test with this test data that the model never seen before. Again, it's our key. It's, it's extremely important to keep this test set um, separate. So typically when we talk about, again, regression or, or classification and supervised learning pipeline, um, we're thinking about this picture. Mm. There is this model training and there is a model application. So during the training, we actually create algorithm. And then during the model applications, we use it um, to solve particular problems. Now, when we build algorithms, the key job of a data scientist is to actually create features that can be used in this algorithm. Now, features is a combination of the values that you have uh, of, the, of, of something you have in your input, right? That would make sense and that you would believe uh, will be important for, for an algorithm performance. If, for example, you want to predict if somebody uh, is gonna uh, churn out or, or if somebody is gonna default on, uh, on the credit, right? On the loan. And uh, what you have is their transactions. So with traditional machine learning, algori machine learning algorithms like uh, um, you know, decision tree, you cannot just take transactions and put it, them into the decision tree. It will not work too well. But instead, what you can do is you can generate, create features. Now, feature in this case can be some combination of those transactions that will, you feel will be important to solve your problem, right? For example, I can look into how many transactions a particular person had uh, within the last month, right? If he's active customer or not. I can calculate the total sum of the transactions. Uh, if he pays a lot, then you know, he'll have less chance to pay off the debt. Or uh, if he has debts you know, in other banks, or how much money he has coming into his account every month, which actually tells me about his salary, right? So these features is what you try to, you know, think of um, as, as being helpful for, for the model to later on predict what it has to predict. And in this sense, this feature creation is really sort of the key uh, for the successful model. And that's where you combine the skill set of like data scientists, so knowing how to build features and also domain knowledge, understanding what is important within these features. 
And then you select the right machine learning algorithm, whether it is again decision series, random forest, the regressions, linear regression, whatever you need to, and and you know, tune it, um, test it, train it, test it, and deploy it. Now. This pipeline is defined for, again, sort of traditional machine learning algorithms. When we talk about deep learning methods, um, the, the, the characteristic difference is that within the deep learning, you typically work on a raw data, and so you don't really need to do this feature extraction. So there is no typically features created. You can just sort of put the raw data into the model. Now, there is sort of no free lunch which means very often it just doesn't work right away. So you still need to do some sort of data pre-processing to make it work. And you need to have a lot of data and the training takes much, much longer. So in some sense, you sort of outsource your you know, human knowledge and, and human work and creating features to the machine itself, right? Um, running, hoping that it will be sort of smart enough to um, operate without those features compensating it, compensating uh, them by the amount of data. So again, you know, you might hope that you can actually train a model using like for the life neural networks uh, by taking this transactional data and just putting it directly into the model without trying to create features. So far, most of the algorithms that work in practice that work in, in, in real world, they are feature based, but, um, you know, it, it, it very well can be that in the near future, uh, we'll see more and more of deep learning models, especially um, with, with the foundation models and, and the notion of pre-training of the models. But right now, and again, this is an introductory course. So uh, we're gonna be focusing on uh, um, building models with features. And so your job as a data scientist will be to create features from um, the data. So, you know, thinking sort of the big picture uh, is within the supervised machine learning workflow, you know, we need to prepare data. And in fact, that usually takes a lot of time and effort preparing data, which is, you know, you clean the data, you understand what the data means, um, you, you, you put it the right way, you, you kind of um, prepare it for the algorithm in the right format. Um, then you actually build a model, which is you, you do feature engineering. So you come up with these ideas, how to combine the, you know, the data um, to make meaningful features. Then you select what type of model you want to use. Um, then you uh, train the model, then you test the model. Um, you, you, you kind of verify the stability of the model. Um, if needed, you go and check the data again. And um, after that's done, you model ready, then it goes to actual production. And that's when uh, sort of business unit can start using it. And again, typically in the real world, you will be the one responsible to deliver it to the business. And um, you'll be the one who will be supporting this model for a while, making sure it uh, produces sort of the right um, output. So that is pretty much the end for this very short um, you know, introduction to machine learning. Um, there are a couple of books I would recommend if you have time to read. Um, the Introduction to Statistical Learning, though it has applications in R, but it's actually a pretty good book. Um, so you don't need to know R or look into the R code, but it's sort of small, short, but quite in-depth book. And there is Machine Learning Learning by Andrew Ng, um, also kind of good introduction into overall machine learning tasks. So with that, uh, we are done for today. Any questions? I think All right. so. All right, well, if there's no question, great. Um, and I mean, with, with machine learning guys, uh, it, it's a hands, on discipline, like data science is a hands-on discipline. So, uh, you know, lectures gives you sort of overview and, and, and put some, you know, concepts and ideas in your head, but you really learn during the seminars and lab sessions. So I know you had one before and the one is gonna be starting soon. Have fun.
Thank, Thank you. you. And bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.